All right, the recording is started. So, welcome back, everybody. It's our the next Bible study from our ministry, and you can see the title there says "A Crime in Gibeah." The subtitle Judges chapter nineteen. If you'll recall, we, we've we've been taking the task of doing some of the more difficult lessons in the scripture lately and this is the third one in a row now that has has been one of those uh, or some of those places in the scriptures that we just uh, don't understand don't like don't enjoy reading but we've taken the approach here that as Paul told us that all scripture is is for us we need to not shy away from these things we need to dive into them so uh, see the title there, A Crime in Gibeah. That's what we're going to study tonight. So let's go to the Word, go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will begin. Abba Father, we love you and we thank you for these nights that we can be together with friends and family to open up your Word and to dive into your Scripture, Father, and to pull out our shovels and to really dig and to understand what it is you would have us understand, especially, Lord, with these these chapters that are so seldom read and so seldom studied out of either fear or misunderstanding or for whatever the reason, Father, we pray that you would remove all of those elements from us this evening, that you would simply allow us to see you in the Scriptures and have us understand the true meaning of why you chose to leave these in your Word for us to read today. We ask this your blessing on our time together. In the name of your Son, Yeshua, amen. So a crime in Gibeah. Now, like I just said, we wanted to go into these because we believe, as Paul tells us here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of Elohim and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. This, you've heard this many times before. We've used this as an introductory slide for now this is the third lesson in a row because it brings home right up front the answer to the question, why are we studying this? Because it is in Scripture. And if you'll recall from last time and if you didn't see uh, last week's lesson on Judges chapter 11, I urge you to go and, and get that. But as you can see from Judges chapter 11, there are lessons for the believer, lessons for the bond servant that go so much deeper than a simple reading of, of what's in the, in the Bible. And of course, we're reading the King James here, but uh, regardless of what your translation is, the lessons are deeper than a simple reading of the words on the page. But we've also talked about these four words, doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction, and we kind of outlined what those are because this is in itself a tough sentence, a tough verse to understand if you don't know what Paul is talking about. So just real quickly, doctrine is what is right. So when Paul tells you that all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, he's telling you that all Scripture tells you what is right. When he talks about reproof, he's telling you about what is not right. So we can understand and we will certainly see examples of what is not right tonight. For correction is how to get it right. And then lastly, instruction is how to keep it right. And of course, that's the main point of our ministry is to do the instruction to, to increase our understanding and therefore our obedience of God's word, especially the Torah, God's law. And so this is uh, why we're still in these very tough chapters. But Paul says all scripture, right? In other words, even the parts about which we may feel uncomfortable, even the parts that we may not have clear understanding, the parts of which we may be afraid, the parts that we may want to forget, even the parts that we may not want to believe. I think you could apply all of those to Judges chapter 11 that we did last week, and you could definitely apply all of those to Judges chapter 19 that we're going to study tonight. So again, why are we going to do this? Why are, why are we going to talk about something that's uh, obviously uh, quite an awful story? It's because it is ordained by God to be in His Word, 
and it is for us to understand. If we have chosen to follow him, we need to understand everything about him, especially considering that one of the primary tenets of our ministry is to dissuade this notion of Chrislam, or the, the combination of Christianity and Islam, or the, uh, in other words, the uh, suggestion that the God of the Bible is the same as the God of Islam, uh, we know that that's not true, and we are trying to dissuade uh, those that would listen to our lessons uh, from believing such. And the point is that there are some things in the Quran that describes a very ugly, mean, lying, hateful, despiteful God. There are things that if we don't thoroughly study the Bible and understand what's being said, people could make the same statement about God. They would do so without the correct understanding. So one of our points in studying this is so that we can get the right understanding of our God, so that we can, again, show the difference between the God of the Bible and the God of Islam. All right, and one last slide then, speaking of the preface here, also Paul in Romans chapter 15 verse 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Of course, Judges chapter 19 was written before Paul wrote this verse, and we have to include it in the word whatsoever. So again, a second proof from the scripture that what we are doing tonight, studying what we are studying tonight is not at all wrong. As a matter of fact, I think that it is, uh, it, it's actually to be applauded that we are not shying away from the tough stuff, if you would. Now let's get busy with Judges chapter 19. And I go ahead and turn there because we're going to read all of Judges chapter 19. And um, you're going to need your scriptures tonight. We're going to be reading quite a few places. So while you're turning there, I'm going to begin. And I'm reading the King James. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. And his concubine played the whore against him and went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there four whole months. And her husband arose and went after her to speak friendly unto her and to bring her again, having his servant with him and a couple of asses, donkeys. And she brought him into her father's house. And when the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. And his father-in-law, the damsel's father, retained him. And he abode with him three days. So they did eat and drink and lodge there. Now, I'm reading the King James, and there are some things in the King James that really don't make a great deal of sense we're going to thoroughly explain Judges chapter 19 after we read it. Okay, So we'll come back and visit these verses again. Back to verse 5. And it came to pass on the fourth day, when they arose early in the morning, that he rose up to depart. And the damsel's father said unto his son-in-law, Comfort thine heart with a morsel of bread, and afterward go your way. And they sat down and did eat and drink, and both of them. For the damsel's father had said unto the man, Be content, I pray thee, and tarry all night, and let thine heart be merry. And when the man rose up to depart, the father-in-law urged him, therefore he lodged there again. And he rose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart, and the damsel's father said, Comfort thine heart, I pray thee. And they tarried until afternoon, and they did eat, both of them. And when the man rose up to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the damsel's father, said unto him, Behold, now the day draweth toward evening. I pray you, tarry all night. Behold, the day groweth to an end. Lodge here, that your heart may be merry, and tomorrow get you early on your way, that thou mayest go home. But the man would not tarry that night, but he rose up and departed, and came over against Jebus, that is, Jerusalem. And there were with him two asses saddled, and his concubine was also with him. And when they were by Jebus, or Jerusalem, the day was far spent, and the servant said unto his master, Come, I pray thee, and let us turn in unto this city of the Jebusites, and lodge in it. His master said unto him, We will not turn aside hither into the city of a stranger. That is not the children of Israel. We will pass over to Gibeah. And he said unto his servant, Come, let us draw near to one of these places to lodge all night in Gibeah or in Ramah. And they passed on and went their way, and the sun went down upon them when they were by Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. And they turned aside thither to go in and to lodge in Gibeah. And when he went in, he sat down in a street of the city, for there was no man that took them into his house 
to lodge. And behold, there came an old man from his work out of the field at even, or at evening, which was also of Mount Ephraim. And he sojourned in Gibeah, but the men of the place were Benjaminites. In other words, this Ephraimite lived in Gibeah, but everybody else was Benjamin, was of the tribe of Benjamin. And when he had lifted up his eyes, he saw a wayfaring man in the street of the city. And the old man said, Whither goest thou, and whence comest thou? In other words, where are you going, and where did you come from? And he said unto him, We are passing from Bethlehem, Judah, toward the side of Mount Ephraim. From thence I am I, or that's where I'm from. And I went to Bethlehem, Judah, but I am now going to the house of the Lord. And there is no man that receiveth me to the house. Or excuse me, to house, to, to, to put me up for the night is what he was saying. <clears throat> Yet there is both straw and provender for our asses, and there is bread and wine also for me, and for thy handmaid, and for the young man which is with your servants. There is no want of anything. In other words, he's saying we have everything that we need. I just don't have a place to lay my head. That's all. And the old man said, Peace be with thee. Howsoever, let all thy wants lie upon me, only lodge not in the street. So he brought him into his house and gave provender unto the asses, and they washed their feet and did eat and drink. Now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into your house that we may know him. And the man, the master of the house, went out unto them and said unto them, No, my brethren, no, I pray you, do not do so wickedly, seeing that this man has come into my house. Do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out unto, uh, unto you, and humble you them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. But the men would not hearken unto him, so the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them, and they knew her and abused her all night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where the Lord was till it was night. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house, and her hands were upon the threshold. And he said unto her, Up, and let's be going. But none answered. Then the man took her up upon an ass, and the man rose up and got him unto his place. And when he was coming to his house, he took a knife and laid hold on his concubine and divided her together with her bones into twelve pieces and sent her into all the coasts of Israel. And it was so that all that saw it said there was no such deed done nor seen from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt unto this day. Consider of it, take advice, and speak your minds. So there's no doubt that what we are reading is a horrible chapter. What we've just read is unspeakable. It is unthinkable. But we need to dig beneath the words that are written on the page. Let's see exactly what was going on. So we're going to go back now to the beginning of Judges chapter 19, and we're just going to go through the key points, the things that were stated throughout Judges chapter 19. First of all, no king in Israel. Right up front we read that there was no king in Israel. It says, this is the time of Israel prior to the time of a king being established. Just to give you an idea of what is going on, King David hasn't even been born at this point. This is long before the, the people had approached God and said, we want a king like all of the nations around us. But there's a little bit more going on here. This means more than that. Read into it. This is not only a reference to there not being a monarch or a king. It's also a reference to Israel's refusal to recognize God's leadership over them. In other words, you may have heard us talk about this before. The statement, there was no king in Israel, goes right along hand in hand with the statement that you will read in the scriptures. And every man did what was right in his own eyes. You hear that a lot. That's the King James way to put it. And what that's referring to is in this time before the kings, God held men accountable for their own actions. Once God established a king in Israel, you never again see the term, every man did what was right in his own eyes. 
what you see from that point forward is, and the king did what was right in his own eyes. In other words, from the time that God established a king in Israel, God held the king accountable for the nation's sins. At this point, we don't have a king, so every man is doing what is right in his own eyes. There is no king is your clue to not only the time frame, but to God's appraisal of the nation Israel. Where does God put the onus for these sins, for these crimes? So it's clear from, an, uh, from that kind of a background that God is looking at this from an individual level during this time of, of the judges. He took for himself a concubine. The Levite's concubine that we talked about or, uh, in, in 19 was recognized, and I put in parentheses, by man, that's important, recognized by man as his legal partner. But she didn't have the same status in the home or in society as a wife, as a, as a true marriage, if you would. This, he's not alone. You know, to, to us in these days, this, this sounds so terrible. But he was not alone in doing this. In fact, I have a list here of the patriarchs, the biblical patriarchs and examples. We talked a little bit about this last week in Judges chapter 11, about the company of that Jephthah was in in Hebrews chapter 11, the Hall of Faith. And we talked about the crimes or the sins that those men listed in the Hall of Faith had done in their lives. And the same thing here. Abraham had a concubine. Jacob, Caleb, Saul, David, Solomon, and Rehoboam. And that's just to name a few. Well, what's interesting though, about from the time of David on, this is a little known fact. I hadn't planned on putting this in this lesson, but it just occurred to me. From the time of David on, in other words, when God established a king over Israel, he also gave the king a command. The king had to write for himself a copy of the Torah. He had to write all the way from Genesis, beginning of Genesis to the end of Deuteronomy. And he had to read from it daily. So if the king wrote the words, and I can't remember if it's Deuteronomy 16.16 16 or Deuteronomy 17.17, 17, but one of those tells explicitly that the king will not have more than one wife. Yet King David, especially King Solomon, Rehoboam, and others had many. Solomon had hundreds of wives. So here are these men directly in God's service. David was called a man after God's own heart, and yet you know that he knew it because he was forced to write it by God, to write his own copy of the Torah, and to read from it daily, and yet he disobeyed God. So it wasn't that the... Uh, refusal on behalf of Israel to recognize God as their leader all of a sudden changed at the times once we did get a king. This is a problem. It is still a problem today. Okay? Let's not look down on these people in the scriptures. It is just as much a problem today with even us disobeying what we know God's word tells us to do. But it's very interesting that that is a very, very age-old problem. So does the occurrence then of concubines by prominent patriarchs and other biblical fi uh, figures suggest that it's accepted? If you'll recall last week when we studied Judges chapter 11, near the end, we made a finite decision that God had not approved of the things that occurred in Judges chapter 11. Has God approved of what this Levite is doing? No, of course not. God's opinion of the marriage has not changed. It did not change during the times of the judges. It has not changed today. It's a practice that is neither endorsed, approved, nor blessed by Jehovah. It simply is not. God always meant for a marriage to be between one man and one woman. How do I know that? Well, because when God came here in the flesh... He told us this in Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6. And he answered and said unto them, he of course being Yeshua, God in the flesh, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Now, have you not read this? Jesus is saying. 
Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. In other words, this is the time where Jesus is talking about the divorce decree. And of course, you, you know that Jesus also said that it was because of the hardness of man's heart that Moses allowed the decree of a divorce. It was not intended that way from the beginning. But Jesus is not the only one. We also have Paul in three different places talking about a man being married to only one woman. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, there's two instances here. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, and apt to teach. And then in verse 12, he also applies the same to a deacon. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. Okay. Then later, as he's writing to Titus, in Titus chapter 1, Paul tells Titus, For this cause left I thee in Crete, or in other words, this is why I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. In other words, Paul is saying here it's quite important that, especially as Paul seems to be narrowing it down to a bond servant, a professional, if you will, a servant of God, uh, professionally ministering God's word, that he be the husband of one wife. So I think it's clear that the concubine was never... Uh, intended or accepted or approved or blessed by Jehovah in this way. That's why I said it was accepted by man, but not by God. She plays the whore, the King James says. After she plays the whore, and, and, and I had to leave that in there, it means exactly, I put that in and I went back and I thought about it and I said, no, I'm going to leave it. It means exactly what it says. She had sexual relations with other men. It means exactly what it said. After she left, after she did this, she left and went to her father's house for four months. Is he bothering you? Okay. He goes to her father's house where he is to reconcile with her. Now, I wanted to put another note in here. Something you won't read in the scripture by just reading Judges chapter 19. Although this was not a marriage, although they were not legally wed, this was not his wife under, under God's eyes, if you would. This is an example of love. His actions are one of love. If you go back and you read the beginning of it there, he is going back to speak kindly to her and to tell her that he loves her and to accept her back into his life. And I think that that is an example of, of what should happen in a marriage today in a Christian home when one commits adultery. So it is an example of that. So you, you need to applaud the Levite for that regardless of what happens in the rest of chapter 19. Then we talked about the father's hospitality. You notice that the, every time the Levite tried to leave, the father said, no, stop and, and eat with me and drink and be merry. And you know, then you can go anyway. Tarry for a little while, he said. Well, that was customary. Certainly not the only place in scriptures that you've read before of a delay in leaving a, a visit. An extension of the visit. So it was traditional. The father asked the Levite to stay extra days and nights. In verse 10, we see that the Levite would have no part of further extending. And once it got to the fifth day, he said, no, I'm not going to do this again. I have to leave. So he left with his concubine in the late afternoon. All right. The night in Gibeah. Now we're, we're getting to the part where uh, things are going to get uh, uh, bad. Confusing is the easiest way to say it. After traveling and then refusing to stay in Jebus, remember his servant asked him, can't we just turn in here? And, and he said, no, because what? Do you remember? Because they're not our people. Those are strangers, he said. This is Jerusalem. How can this be strangers? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll answer that one in just a little bit. He said, no, because those are strangers. We're going to go ahead until we can make it either to Gibeah or to Ramah, is what, what his direction was. They end up in Gibeah. It just ends up that that's where they, where they come to when, they're, when the light gives out on them. They thought it would be safer in Gibeah than a town owned by pagans, Jerusalem. Remember, his, his direction was, this is not safe, let's go somewhere else. So, as they're going to find out, that was, of course, a bad, uh, a bad idea. So we get there to Gibeah, and I didn't mean to hit that, and there was no 
room at the end. Now, of course, I'm just taking a little pun on that one, but does not this story remind you of Joseph and Mary going to Bethlehem for the count? They were going there for the, the celebration of the feast and, of course, for the census count. And when they got there, there was no room at the end. They had nowhere to stay. So the Levite and his concubine found no hospitality in Gibeah. This reflects poorly on the people of Gibeah because Jehovah commanded that Israel take care of Israel. Jehovah commanded hospitality among the people of God. We are commanded, again, the exact same thing today, are we not? To help our brothers and our sisters, especially the widows and the young. We are supposed to help one another. We should not turn people away. Jesus even talks about that. What good does it do your neighbor if you see that he's cold and you, and you don't give him a coat? Or you see that he's hungry and you don't feed him? So this goes directly against God's Torah here in Leviticus 19, Leviticus 25, Jesus' own words in Matthew 25, and then Paul in Hebrews 13. So this is discussed throughout the scripture. So right away, what we see then is the, the people in Gibeah even by denying hospitality, are showing, starting to show their true nature. Okay, it sh should be uh, take that as a hint for what's to come. I guess there's something wrong when there's no such hospitality among God's people. So that that's the lesson for us today. We're we'll trying to apply this entire chapter to us today. There's something wrong, and let us remember that we need to apply our hospitality to those in need if we can help. But then we get to this Ephraimite hospitality. We saw this guy turn. Go back to chapter eight, excuse me, verse eighteen, and let's read that again. And the, the the man, the Levite, said unto him, "We are passing from Bethlehem, Judah, toward the side of Mount Ephraim. From there am I." In other words, that's where I come from. And I went to Bethlehem, Judah, but I am now going to the house of the Lord. Wait a minute now. We just said earlier that Jerusalem was owned by pagans. Where's the house of the Lord? Where is it that he's going? Now we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. And he says, And there is no man that receiveth me to house. Now look at this next note that I have on the slide. The house of the Lord at this time is in Shiloh. Turn with me back to the left one chapter. Let's go to Judges 18. And verse 31, it's the very last verse in Judges 18. And we could read the preceding verses right up into this. It's just talking about Dan and Beersheba and how, how the nations are divided and where they're set up. Suffice it to say, verse 31, it just simply says, And they set up Micah's graven image. Gives you yet another idea of how the people of Israel were living their lives in this day. All the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. So moving right into Judges 19, we know where the altar is right now. We know where the, where the house of the Lord is. It's in Shiloh. We've been told that Jerusalem is owned by pagans or strangers. He didn't feel that it was safe there. And he's going to the house of the Lord. So we know where he's going to Shiloh. Tells us that from Judges 18 there. So finally... A fellow Ephraimite finds them and extends hospitality, which we just read in verse 20 there. So the only person to extend hospitality to them was a man from their own region. In other words, a visitor as well. Not necessarily a short-term visitor, but a foreigner, let's put it that way, uh, to the city of Gibeah. But he gives them hospitality and brings them into the house. Now, the trouble begins. In verse 22 we read something very disturbing. In fact, from verse 22 on. Now, I want you to follow with me here because we're going to be doing some page turning over the next few pages as we talk about some other places in Scripture where this kind of action sounds familiar. Their request, the, the, the request in verse 22, was the same that was made by the homosexuals who surrounded the house of Lot in Sodom. I know that you're familiar with that story. We're actually going to go and read uh, in Genesis chapter 19 in just a moment. So if you want to go ahead and turn there and have your finger in that spot, we will read about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah here in just a moment. Now, I want, before we go to read Genesis 19, I want to recount the story 
that we just read in Judges 19, verses 23 to 26. So let's stay here in Judges 19. It says, And the man, the master of the house, went out unto them, this is, that is, the homosexuals, he, the mob, if you would, and he said unto them, No, my brethren, no, I pray you do not so wickedly, seeing that this man has come into mine house, do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now, and humble you them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you, but unto this man do not so vile a thing. But the men would not hearken to him, so the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them. And they knew her, and abused her all the night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. So, seeing or now recounting that story, if you would, let's turn to Genesis. We're not going directly to 19. First of all, I want you to go to Genesis 18. No, excuse me, 13. We're going to get to 19 in a minute, so keep your fingers there. But I want you to turn to Genesis 13, and we're just going to look at two verses. Genesis 13, verses 12 and 13. Let's see if we can figure out why we need to read this in the context of this story. Genesis 13, verses 12 and 13. It says, Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So we get right there a little sneak preview, if you would, from God telling you what's going to happen in a little bit. All right, so turn with me now. We've looked at that in Genesis 13. Now we're going to go to Genesis chapter 18, and I want you to turn to verse 17, and we're going to read a few verses in this chapter, also along the same lines. Genesis chapter 18, 17 to the end of the chapter. And Jehovah said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him. Man, now there, hey, guys, listen to this. Matthew chapter 17, verses 21 through 23, kind of becoming our motto verses for this ministry, if you would. Recall in those verses when they go before the Lord, and the Lord says, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, and I will say what? Depart from me, I never knew you. So, so, so the, the question becomes not, as far as your justification or your walk with God, the question's not, do you know Him? The question is, does he know you? And if you go here to Genesis, what is this? This is God. This is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ standing before Abraham. And what does God say? Shall I hide this from Abraham, what I'm about to do? No, because I know him. You see, that's a whole lesson in itself right there, and which is something I can't miss pointing out. He says, For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of Jehovah to do justice and judgment, that Jehovah may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And Jehovah said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before Jehovah. And Abraham drew near and said, Will you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure, that's one of my absolute favorite King James words. In other words, what if? It's what what Abraham is saying, what if there are 50 righteous within the city? Will you also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. And that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? You know what? When I read the book of Revelation, and we did a great study, two and a half years it took us to go through the book of Revelation, but when I read the book of Revelation, when I see the plagues that happened in the land of Egypt, back in the book of Exodus, and when I compare those plagues to the, the events of God's wrath that are outlined in the book of Revelation, 
And then when I put all of that together with this, when Abraham is looking at God and says, God, it would not be right for you to slay the righteous with the wicked. It gives me such profound hope. And I mean that in the King James Bible version of hope. Hope is stronger than even knowledge. Hope is even better than knowing. It gives me 100% proof that God will not harm his people or will not allow harm to happen to his people when his wrath is poured out on this world. So I, I think that, that that is exactly what Abraham is putting out before God here because if you look at it, Jehovah said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto Jehovah, which am but dust and ashes, speaking about himself. Okay, look, I'm just dust and ashes, but I took it upon myself once to speak to you, so I'm going to do it again. Peradventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Will you destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, in God that is, said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. You guys know that this is the portion of Scripture where Jews learn to dicker on the street, right? This is this is how they learn to run the the shops. But because it, this would not so be so it makes me think of you know in Jerusalem in, in Israel today, life means so much to me. It does. And this that's what it resonated to me is that they will do and go to the complete end, and this is what Abraham was doing. He was pushing, and he was willing to, and to differ with God, and even, you know, and then like, not to make you angry, but, in other words, he was willing to differ right. for every single life. Right. That's right. And, and I want to make certain that, because this is being recorded, that that's understood. Uh, in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, Paul says that he is a Jew who is circumcised of the heart. So when I say that, I say that in pure jest. Uh, that, you know, I, I believe if you are a bondservant, a follower of God, and you are circumcised of the heart, knowing that we serve a Jewish king, I would certainly never say anything derogatory about a Jewish person. That includes myself and my king, okay? So I just want to make sure that that's uh, on recorded too, since I just kind of made a little joke there. Okay, verse 29, And he spake unto him yet again and said, Peradventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, Oh, let not Jehovah be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure there shall be thirty found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, Oh, let not Jehovah be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And Jehovah went his way. As soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. So, so now we've seen the preface, if you would, in Genesis 13, where God tells us that the men in Sodom were wicked. And then we go to here to Genesis 18, and we see the, the dialogue between Abraham and between Jehovah God, and, and we see that Abraham has done everything in his power to prove to us, to get written down in the Scriptures, to prove to us the lengths to which God will go to give every person the ability to accept His Son as Savior and the God the Father as their God, if you would, and that, that they would not feel His wrath. He has proven that here in Genesis. Now we're going to go to Genesis 19 and we're going to read the account. So let's go to Genesis 19 and read the first eight verses. I'm going the wrong way there, sorry. Here we go. Genesis 19, the first eight verses. And there came two angels to Sodom at evening, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Now, this is, uh, again, a King James uh, way of saying uh, those who sat in the gate of a city were the leaders of the city. This was the city council. 
So when you are told here that Lot sat in the gate, what that is saying is that Lot had a seat. Think of it as an elected position, much like when we say that an incumbent in a, in a political position was unseated when they lose an election. Uh, Lot had a seat on the city council is what this, uh, what this little sentence means. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house and tarry all night and wash your feet and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, No, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and into, entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. Now, I'm not having a hard time reading the words. I'm purposely slowing down to make certain that we digest all the words. It says, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round. How many people, this house that we're in right now, how many people would it take to form a crowd completely around this house? I mean, I mean you think about it. To form a crowd all the way around all four sides, hundreds. All right? And both old and young. So this isn't just a fad amongst the, the teenagers. And it goes even further. All the people from every quarter. There, there's not an, an area of Sodom that is exempt from this disease of sin that, that has infected Sodom. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Now, I didn't go into this in tonight's lesson. I have before. But we read this exact same phrase in Judges chapter 19 where, where they were told to send out the man. First they wanted the man, the Levite. And it said that, that we may know him. I want to make sure that we understand that this is King James polite English for having sexual relations. This is the same as when the Levite does put the concubine out and it says... They knew her. They had sexual relations with her. It's going to get even worse before this lesson is over. But I want to make sure that you understand what they're asking here. And we're not going to hold back as if we're in a, a fifth grader's kindergarten or Sunday school class. We're going to say exactly what the scripture would have us to understand. Bring them out that we may know them. And Lot went out the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Again, another use of the word no. In other words, they have not had sexual relations with men. In other words, they were virgins. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and you do to them as is good in your eyes, only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. In other words, what he's saying here is they're, my, they're, they're in my purview of protection. In other words, what he's saying here is that this guy would literally rather see his daughters sexually abused by this crowd of men than to have the shame put upon him of one of his visitors being abused by these men. It's hard for us to comprehend. And again, like we talked about in Judges 11 last week, let's not assume that because we're reading the account in the Scriptures that the actions of Lot here, or the Levite in Judges chapter 19, are approved by God. Let's not make that decision or that assumption. There are many things written in the Scriptures in order to get the point across. Like last week we said, God used even wicked men, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, to serve his purpose. That does not mean that God endorses the wickedness by the men in the stories that we're reading. The stories that we're reading are there out of necessity, but we cannot assume that because we're reading them, they automatically have God's approval. Okay? Before we go much further, we needed to have that 
firm understanding. They knew her, it says. Back to Judges 19 now, verse 25. It says that they knew her. It tells us what these wicked men did to the concubine. But when well, what we read was the King James polite English. When I was talking about this a moment, I said it's going to get worse. Well, I'm going to spare you because I was even spared. As I was doing research on this, when describing the full meaning of the original Hebrew, Adam Clark, who was an, an 18th century commentator, due to modesty, did not even translate the meaning into English. He left it in Latin so that only a select few of very learned, very educated people who could fathom and, and, and take what was being said would understand what these men did to her. So I'm going to leave that to you. But what I'm, going, what I'm getting at is hundreds of people compassed around the house with one concubine. I want you to understand the gravity, the nature of how horrific this is. I did not seek to learn more about the details. I think enough is enough. So we're going to move on. Wicked is as wicked does. This clearly shows us that in the times of the judges, Israel was as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah. This is God's chosen people. This is what man is capable of doing when they turn their back on God. I don't care that they're God's chosen people. I don't care who they are. I don't care if they're the Baptist church down the street. Could this happen today? Well, you know what? It was unthinkable in these days. It would probably be on MSNBC as being applauded today. When I hear God as in the form of, uh, in his carnate form of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, when I hear him say that as in the days of Noah, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. And I look back and I see what was happening in the land in the days of Noah. And then I see even after God was so repulsed with man that he destroyed them all. And we get back to this disgusting state. And then I can see today's headlines. There's no difference, guys. There are, please trust me, you guys have sat through our studies of Islam. There are people in this world doing just as vile, possibly even more vile things to men and women all around this world today. So trust me when I say that when Jesus says, as the days of Noah were, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man be, the days are now as they were in the days of Noah. So I, I don't know how much more to say about that. I think the point is driven home. This, what I didn't lead into at the beginning of why are we studying this, what I didn't say is because what we're studying could very easily be today's headlines. It's like having a mirror. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And so, again, we could stay there and harp on that point uh, for a long time, but let's move on. So, is the rest of this chapter then, the rest of Judges 19 that we read, going to outline God's punishment for those involved? Just as Genesis outlines his, his punishment on Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zeboim, by the way, it wasn't just two cities. We read only of Sodom and Gomorrah, but if you look in Deuteronomy and in Jeremiah, you read that there were actually four cities. We can't forget Adma and Zeboim were also destroyed. So there were four that were destroyed here. But So is, is, that, what, is that what the rest of Judges chapter 19 is going to do for us? Does the Bible want us to believe that this is the right thing to do? Sorry. Does the Bible want us to believe that this is the right thing to do? Though the perverted men of Gibeah were clearly guilty, so were the Levite and the Ephraimite. They were just as guilty of sin and crime as were the men on the outside. They clearly should have been willing to sacrifice themselves. In other words, what I mean by this slide is yet another proof 
that what we're reading in Judges 19 is the story of what happened because we need to understand it is not the story of what happened because God approved. God most certainly does not approve of what happened in this occurrence. The discovery. So in verses 27 through 30, we read about the Levite discovering his concubine dead at the front door. Recall she made her way at, dawning, at, the, at the dawn to the door, to the, the door frame of the house. And then he came out and he said, get up, let's be on our way. And the King James says, and none answered. In other words, she did not answer him. She was already dead. She, she died from the abuse that she had withstood all night. He issues a call for a national judgment against the men who had done this horrible deed. Let's look again at verses 29 and 30. Let's read these again. Judges 19 verses 29 and 30. Let's see what we're talking about here. And when he was come into his house, he took a knife and laid hold on to his concubine and divided her together with her bones into twelve pieces and sent her into all the coasts of Israel. And it was so that all that saw it said there was no such deed done nor seen from the day the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt unto this day. Consider it, take advice, and speak your minds. Now, where did I get... He issues a call for national judgment. All this says in verses 29 and 30 is that he took her inside and cut her into 12 pieces and sent her throughout the nation Israel. Well, what we... Again, if you just read the words on the page, you won't understand. His reason for doing this was to physically show evidence to all the people of Israel to have them judge the men of Gibeah that had committed this crime. It seems awful to us because the King James doesn't just come out and say... And so the Levite did something awful in order to accomplish something good. It doesn't suggest that. It just says that he did something awful. Some say this is a, a painful demonstration of the heartless actions towards the concubine. It is. It does seem heartless and painfully horrible. But there's more to it than the physical action of cutting her into pieces and sending her. There's a lot more to it. And that's what we're going to learn the, the, the rest of the story tonight, if you would. Verse 30. What is it that is being referred to in verse 30 when it says that all that saw it said there was no such deed done nor seen from the day the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt unto this day? What is it? The word deed. No such deed done. What is the deed that they're talking about was not done? Is it the cutting up of the concubine and sending her throughout? It would lead you to believe that. Verse 29 says, and he did this, and then the people said, oh, that's so bad that's never been seen or done before. Guess what? That is not what they're referring to. What they're referring to is what the men did to the woman, not what the Levite did to her. In other words, if we backed up a couple of slides and I said, where did I get this idea that he was calling for a national judgment? It comes directly from verse 30. When he cut her up and he sent her throughout the land, verse 30 then, the nation, when they received it, the nation as a whole said, we see what happened to this woman and there has been no such deed done. In other words, they did judge. They judged right there in verse 30. So he called for a national judgment through his actions and he received it. How do we know this? We're going to read chapter 20. That's your bonus for tonight. I didn't talk about that. I wanted to surprise you, but we have to, in order to stand, understand verse nine, chapter 19, we have to get, as Paul Harvey would say, remember this, guys, and now the rest of the story. The men of Israel gathered together in accord against the wickedness of which they had heard were enforcing Torah. We're going to see Torah being enforced now. The whole chapter 19 has been disgusting to us. Now we're going to see men obey God. Finally, to understand their process, 
We also have to know Torah. This is why our teaching in this ministry of obedience is so important. So I want you to turn with me. First, we're going to look in Torah. We're going to go to Deuteronomy. I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 13 and find verse 12. I want to talk to you a minute about what Torah says, about what God's teaching and instruction says about a case like what we are studying tonight. So, Deuteronomy 13, verses 12 through 8. And if thou shalt hear say in one of thy cities, which the Lord thy God hath given thee to dwell there, saying, Certain men, the children of Belial, do you remember reading this earlier tonight? Guess what? Belial is a false god. When people say there's only one God, they're right. But when people say there is no such thing as another God, they're wrong. The Bible lists in excess of 40 names of other gods. Now, I agree that they're not truly gods. There is only one God, period. However, in the eyes and in the hearts of those who worship these gods, they are just as real as my God is to me and as my God is to you. And when God says that these are children of Belial, as he says here in Deuteronomy, what he's saying is that these people do not worship him. They worship another god, a man-made false god. Nonetheless, they are devoted to and they worship that god. Okay? That's uh, easy for us to understand. It's, it's a tough subject for a lot of folks to, to understand, though. Certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which you have not known. Then shall you inquire and make search and ask diligently. And behold, if it be true and that thing certain that such abomination is wrought among you, you shall surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, Pay attention. Destroying it utterly and all that is therein and the cattle thereof with the edge of the sword. And thou shalt gather all the spoil of it into the midst of the street thereof and shalt burn with fire the city and all the spoil thereof every whit for the Lord thy God and it shall be a heap forever and it shall not be built Again, and there shall cleave naught, or there shall be nothing of the cursed thing to your hand. In other words, none of this will be on you. The, the, the whole problem will be on that which is destroyed. That Jehovah may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show you mercy and have compassion upon you and multiply you as he has sworn unto thy fathers when thou shalt hearken to the voice of Jehovah your Elohim to keep all his commandments which I command you this day to do that which is right in the eyes of Jehovah thy God. Earlier tonight we talked about the statement we find throughout the, the Old Testament scriptures that says every man did what was right in his own eyes. Here, what has God commanded? You do what is right in the eyes of God. That's what you do. This is what God has said. And he says, then will I bless you. So we see what God's commandment here is when you see such wickedness, you are to destroy it. In fact, God uses the word in the King James here, utterly destroy it. Do you know what that means? It means destroy it all completely destroy it and, and then burn it. Is the key 13 where our God asked for the one? That's exactly right. Because recall we read that in Judges 19 that these men of Gibeah were serving Belial. And in other words, and, and it could have been any other god. It could have been Baal. It could have been Moloch. It could have been any of the other gods listed in the scriptures. The god, the false god, is not the point. The point is that they are doing what is right in their own eyes. That they are not serving God. Okay? That is the, that is the point. Now, let's turn to Judges chapter 20. I want to show you, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. Then all the children of Israel went out, and the congregation was gathered together as one man, from Dan even to Beersheba, with the land of Gilead unto the Lord in Mizpah. 
And the chief of all the people, even all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 footmen that drew sword. Now, unlike Judges 19, I'm going to do some personal commentating as we read Judges 20. Last time we read all of 19, then I went through it. Now I'm going to do it the other way. Because we're just going to stay on this slide as we go through Judges 20. But I want to talk about some of the things that are most important as we read through here. So what we've read so far is the people of Israel now are gathered together. In other words, this national judgment that the Levite called for. In other words, his, his still as unbelievably grotesque as it is to us, his dividing of the concubine into 12 pieces and sending her throughout the land of Israel has worked. He has united the people together under God, it says, at Mizpah, and they are of one accord in unity, standing against the sin that has happened to this concubine. This does not relieve the Levite of his sin. Okay, guys? Again, you're not going to read that in the Scriptures. But just as much as we have proven to ourselves that this is not approved of by God, this is also not to negate the sin and the crime to placed on the Levite for what he has done. All right? Okay, verse 3. And now the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel were gone up to Mizpah. The children of Benjamin, as we're going to find out here in chapter 20, are going to be the ones who are guilty of this crime at Gibeah. The children of Benjamin. Then said the children of Israel, tell us. In other words, they're facing the children of Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. You have all of Israel arrayed against one tribe. And they say, tell us, how was this wickedness? In other words, what they're saying in today's English would be, what the heck? What was that? What did you do? And the Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered and said, I came into Gibeah that belongeth to Benjamin, I and my concubine, to lodge. I'm sorry, at this point they're coming after he did the national call for judgment. Now they're coming to him, the Levite, I'm sorry. They're, they're asking him, tell us the story, tell us what happened. And he says, I, 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 was, I was going to, uh, into Gibeah, and I and my concubine to lodge. And the men of Gibeah rose against me and beset the house round about upon me by night and thought to have slain me. And my concubine have they forced that she is dead. In other words, what the Levite has done here is he's, he's kind of downplaying the situation. What he's saying here is, but all of these men wanted to come in the house and killed me. They wanted me, which they did. He's telling the truth. But what he's, he's downplaying what he's done to the concubine by saying, I did it to save myself. So I took my concubine, verse 6, and I cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel, for they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. Behold, you are all children of Israel. Give here your advice and counsel. And all the people arose as one man, saying, We will not any of us go to his tent, neither will any of us turn into his house. But now this shall be the thing which we will do to Gibeah. We will go up by lot against it. And we will take ten men of a hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel. And a hundred of a thousand. And a thousand out of ten thousand. More with the King James polite way to translate things here. In other words, we're going to take one tenth of our army. Is what they're saying. Of all the tribes of Israel. To fetch victual for the people that they may do when they come to Gibeah of Benjamin. Here we find out that the people who did this were Benjaminites according to all the folly that they have wrought in Israel. So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city knit together as one man. And the tribes of Israel sent men through all the tribe of Benjamin saying what wickedness is this that is done among you. Now this is where they're approaching the Benjaminites and they go what the heck what did you do? What have you done or what have you allowed to be done? Now therefore deliver us the men, the children of Belial, which are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and put away evil from Israel. So the men of Israel here are doing the right thing. What they're doing first is they went to, if you would, the city council of Benjamin and they said, 
What have you done? Give up the men that are guilty that we can enforce Deuteronomy chapter 13, if you would. We want to enforce the death penalty on these men. We have to wipe this out of Israel. But the children of Benjamin would not hearken to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. But the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together out of the cities unto Gibeah to go to battle against the children of Israel. So Benjamin said, no, we're not. We're, we're harboring these fugitives and we're not going to give them up. We will all fight. And the children of Benjamin were numbered at that time out of the cities 20 and 6,000 men that drew the sword beside the inhabitants of Gibeah, which were numbered 700 chosen men. Among all the people there were 700 chosen men left-handed. Everyone could sling stones at a hair breadth and not miss. Now, I want to, uh, as a kind of a sidebar, just a minute, the Hebrew word here that has been translated by the King James, miss, is the word for sin. In other words, sin is to miss the mark. Sin is to miss the mark. And it doesn't matter if you miss the mark by an inch or, or a mile. If you miss the mark, you miss the mark. And so, even though this is not saying that these guys could not sin, that's not what it's saying. It's just funny that the original Hebrew word used here is the word for, for sin. Verse 17, And the men of Israel, beside Benjamin, were numbered 400,000 men that drew the sword. All these were men of war. And the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God. Now I want you to pay attention. This is going to happen three times. They're going to go up to the house of God and they ask counsel of God. Recall last week when we talked about uh, Joshua in Joshua chapter 9 that he did not ask counsel of God. He made the vow with the people and then he let them live as servants because he had made a vow but he did not ask God what he should do. And uh, here the people of Israel go to the house of God to ask the counsel of God, and they said, Which of us shall go up first to the battle against the children of Benjamin? And Jehovah said, Judah shall go up first. And the children of Israel rose up in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. And the men of Israel put themselves in array to fight against them at Gibeah. And the children of Benjamin came forth out of Gibeah and destroyed down to the ground of the Israelites that day 20 and 2,000 men. And the people, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and sat their battle again in array in the place where they put themselves in array the first day. And the children of Israel went up and wept now. The first time they went up and sought the Lord's counsel. Now, the second time, they went up and they wept before the Lord until the evening. And they asked counsel of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up again to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And the Lord said, Go up against him. And the children of Israel came near again, the children of Benjamin, the second day. And Benjamin went forth against them out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed down to the ground of the children of Israel again 18,000 men. All these drew the sword. Then all the children of Israel, and what's the next words? And all the people went up and came unto the house of God and wept and sat there before Jehovah and fasted that day until evening and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before Jehovah. Can you see now, this is the third time that they've approached God, and can you see an increase in the way they're approaching God? You know what? With every increase of what they're doing, they are being more and more humbled. God is humbling these people. These losses are catastrophic. 22,000 the first day, 18,000 the next day. Both times they've gone to battle against their brethren, against Benjamin, at God's command. God is saying, not yet. Not yet. Now they've come before the Lord, they've wept. All the people, in other words, God through humbling them has created unity. He has created unity finally amongst the children of Israel. And it says, And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days. Remember we alluded to this earlier? 
Judges 18, chapter, uh, chapter 18, verse 31, where we talked about the house of the Lord was in Shiloh. And verse 28, And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days. And so the children of Israel now have come before the Lord again, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into your hands. You see, God did not say that the first two times. He told him to go to battle, but he never said, I'll give you victory. And in fact, he didn't. And he didn't for a reason. He had to put their mind straight. He had to put their minds in a worshipful state in order to do this. So Israel set liars in wait around Gibeah. That means people lying down. That doesn't, that's not L-I-A-R as in someone who tells a lie. That's people lying down uh, around uh, Gibeah. And the children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day and put themselves in array against Gibeah as at other times. And the children of Benjamin went up, went out against the people and were drawn away from the city. And they began to smite the people and kill, as at other times, in the highways, of which one goeth up to the house of God, and the other to Gibeah in the field, about thirty men of Israel. And the children of Benjamin said, They are smitten down before us as at the first. But the children of Israel said, Let us flee and draw them from the city unto the highways. And all the men of Israel rose up out of their place and put themselves in array at Baal Tamar. And the liars in wait of Israel came forth out of their places, even out of the meadows of Gibeah. And there came against Gibeah ten thousand chosen men out of Israel, and the battle was sore. But they knew not that evil was near them. In other words, the children of Benjamin didn't realize what was about to hit them. And Jehovah smote Benjamin before Israel. And the children of Israel destroyed all of the Benjamins that day, twenty and five thousand and a hundred men. All these drew the sword. Now, you know, if you, if you didn't know better, I would think that these people, these Israelites, in setting up this battle plan, these generals, if you would, we're, we're, we're probably fans of Joshua because if you go back to Joshua chapter 8, you'll read about the battle at Ai and this is exactly how Joshua destroyed them. He called them out and, and then as they began to believe they were winning, the Joshua's men fled from before them. And once the, the bad guys, if you would, the, the uh, uh, people that lived in Ai were far enough from the city, Joshua's other men who had been lying in wait encompassed them behind and now Israel was on both sides and they were able to win the battle at Ai. So this is exactly the same strategy here. So uh, verse 36, so the children of Benjamin saw that they were smitten for the men of Israel gave place to the Benjaminites because they trusted unto the liars in wait which they had set in Gibeah and the liars in wait hasted and rushed upon Gibeah and the liars in wait drew themselves along and smote all the city with the edge of the sword. Now think back to Deuteronomy 13 and the command that God gave. He said to utterly destroy it with the edge of the sword. Did he not? Now there was an appointed sign between the men of Israel and the liars in wait that they should make a great flame with smoke rise up out of the city. And when the men of Israel retired in the battle, Benjamin began to smite and kill the men of Israel, about thirty persons, for they said, Surely they are smitten down before us, as in the first battle. But when the flame began to arise up out of the city with a pillar of smoke, the Benjaminites looked behind them, and behold, the flame of the city ascended up to heaven. And when the men of Israel turned again, the men of Benjamin were amazed, for they saw that evil was come upon them. In other words, now they realize, uh-oh, we're in trouble. Therefore they turned their backs before the men of Israel unto the way of the wilderness, but the battle overtook them, and them which came out of the cities they destroyed in the midst of them. Thus they enclosed the Benjaminites round about and chased them and trod them down with ease against Gibeah toward the sun rising. And there fell of Benjamin 18,000 men, all these were men of valor. And they turned and fled toward the wilderness unto the rock of Remen, and they gleaned of them in the highways 5,000 men, and pursued hard after them unto Gibbon, and slew 2,000 men of them there. So that all which fell that day of Benjamin were 20 and 5,000 men that drew the sword. All these were men of valor. And now listen to this. But 600 men turned and fled to the wilderness unto the rock Remen, and abode in the rock Remen four months. In other words, 
Benjamin had a remnant of 600 men who were not killed in battle. They got away and they went to Remen for four months. But what was God's command back in Deuteronomy in the Torah? God's command was to destroy all. Utterly destroy with the edge of the sword. So we're going to close with verse 48. And the men of Israel turned again upon the children of Benjamin and smote them with the edge of the sword as well the men of every city as the beast and all that came to hand also they set on fire all the cities that they came to. So the moral of all of this lesson is that Israel came together in unity. Nothing of the disgusting things that we have read in chapter 19 of Judges was approved by God. God did not approve of the uh, the rape and, and the, the sexual uh, abuse that the men did to the concubine. God did not approve of the Levite having a concubine. God did not approve of the Levite sending the concubine out. God did not approve of the Ephraimite who had him in his house sending his family out. God did not approve of any of the sin, the evil that we've read in chapter 19. And we as a ministry can't read chapters like Judges 19 and come to the conclusion that God would make an exception and allow such a thing. He does not, folks. The stories have to remain so that we can learn the lesson. The lesson is, in this case, regardless of the evil, and let's keep in mind that God will even use a wicked man to accomplish his purpose. So regardless of the evil, the outcome was a united Israel who turned against sin, who turned against every man doing what was right in his own eyes and turned towards God's Torah. They turned towards God with weeping. They turned toward God with fasting. Fasting is a way of humbling yourself. Fasting is a way of self-denial. Fasting is a way of saying, not my will, but yours. And once they were humbled, God gave them the spirit and the ability to do what he needs done. We, we have to be able to give a reason for what we believe. When people approach you and they say to you, that you can't talk about the God of Islam being a mean and hateful God because look what your own God has allowed. We have to understand God's Word in order to stand our ground and say, no, my God is destroying evil. My God doesn't want it this way. My God says He's not willing that any should perish. But man has a hard heart. In the Scriptures we're told that the heart is desperately wicked and who can know it desperately wicked we're told that the heart is dirty God simply wants us to be humble and obedient but when we're not God can certainly make the decision as he has as a sovereign God to utterly destroy the person in order to utterly destroy the evil so the conclusion, this is one of those places in scriptures where we have to read what is not written on the page. It's not written anywhere that God approved of this. We have to read it for ourselves. God did not approve of this. It's not written anywhere that any of the stuff that we've read tonight is set for our example to go and do these things. We have to be able to read what's not written on the page and know where we need to stand with our God. Like Judges chapter 11, we must not infer what is happening and we certainly must not apply false approval to Jehovah. He did not ever approve of what the Levite did to his concubine. So I hope that I've made that point clear. This is definitely a lesson in unity for the body. Unity for the body. I, I didn't say for Israel. For the body of believers. Or, I can use the word Israel, as long as we understand that we are a part of Israel. We are a part of God's chosen people. If He has called you to be His servant, His bondservant, you are a part of Israel. You serve a Jewish king 
And we need to understand that as a body, we need unity. Why are there 30,000 plus denominations in the United States amongst the church? Is this not a lesson for today? Is not the body of Christ so divided that you can't hardly find two churches that would completely agree with one another? This lesson is for today. This chapter, as disgusting as it is for us, this chapter is for today. It's for you as an individual. It's for us as a body. And it's definitely, if you've studied with us the difference between the body of Christ and the bride of Christ, it's definitely a lesson for the bride of Christ. Because if you consider His, if you consider yourself a bondservant, and you are His and devoted to Him as part of His bride, it's definitely a lesson for you to understand we should all have the exact same understanding of our God and, and the exact same actions. So I hope that, that that tells you know the answer, why in the world would you study such a tough chapter? Because it is for today. So I'll tell you what, before we do questions because of the time, and so we can stop the recording. Let's go ahead and, and pray. I'm going to put this over to our invitation slide like we do every time now at the end there. And uh, so if, if, you're, if you're watching this on the Internet, uh, please you know, feel free to read this as we close in prayer. And if something on there is speaking to you, answer the call. Abba, Father, we love you. and We thank you, Lord, for this lesson. We thank you, Father, for opening our eyes to the the absolute toughest parts of your word. And we pray that you will never let our ministry stop looking at an honest look at your word, Father. We, we want to understand everything that you've given us in your word. We want to not shy away, run away, or be afraid of any part of your scripture. But we want to understand that you are a loving God. And if you've placed it before us, that you've placed it before us for a reason. And we pray that you will allow us to read it and be blessed by the understanding of your reasons, Father. Use us in your ministry, Father. Strengthen us. Humble us for sure. And make it so that when people see us, they see you. But use us nonetheless, Father. Let us be your mouthpiece and get us the ability to speak boldly with the truth with your Son, Yeshua. And we ask also, Father, in closing, that you would be with those men and women serving our nation around this world, that you would comfort them and give them safety, Father. And if there's one, even one, that doesn't know you, Father, like Abraham said about the city of Sodom, if there's, if there's just one, Father, will you spare and send someone to call and, and to bring that person into your service now, Father, we ask in the name of your Son, Yeshua. Amen.